Welcome to the Manitoba Ag Days podcast, featuring speakers from our 2017 event. This podcast features Keith Gabbert from the Canola Council of Canada, and his talk is called Sclerotinia, the Other White Combine. Good morning. Oh, that's even louder than I expected. So I was told to expect a couple hundred people, and I at least recognize a few faces that are even smiling. So I'm told there's a huge influx as the doors unlock and people find their way here. And if they're anything like me, my first day, that'll be about 10 minutes from now by the time you ask directions three times uh, and figure out where the booth is. So as mentioned before, my name's Keith Gobbert. I'm uh, an agronomist with the Canola Council, and this would not be a Canola Council presentation without a few obligatory advertising slides. So I'm going to open with those. Canola Council, a full value chain organization, which essentially represents you and every other, okay, don't walk around that much, represents you as a grower and every other member in the value chain uh, to help us grow a better crop of canola. We've got a longer mission statement there if you're a good reader, but really that's about all that you need to know about the Canola Council is that we work for you. A number of agronomists across the prairies work for you, and I'm not going to introduce them all. You'll see my smiling face. I'm not going to use a pointer because there's two screens and I cannot tell which one you're looking at. Uh, but you'll see my face in the middle of Alberta, sort of Pinoka, south to Calgary, and then across to the Saskatchewan border. So my territory ranges from a really nice, thick, deep black soil that always gets enough rain to, I'm going to say Oyen, a really thin brown where if you don't mention rain in the first two minutes of a presentation, they stop listening to you. Now that hasn't been the case for a couple years in that area, but for the most part, rain drives crop production there. And now you're going to hear later in my presentation that rain drives sclerotinia, or moisture anyway. A couple, uh, again, housekeeping items from the Canola Council. You've probably heard our uh, new slogan, new mantra, 52 by 2025. Essentially, we've done some really simple math and we've said, there's going to be a market for canola quality material in the neighborhood of 26 million metric tons. And if we were to try to fill that market, it's going to take 52 bushels per acre for every acre you're currently growing to, to capture what we think is our share of that market. So this is our third try at setting a yield target. And we've handily achieved the last two. And in fact, if you were an agronomist for the Canola Council, uh, those targets seemed pretty aggressive and at times unrealistic for them. So we've got some of the same feedback, but I think it's really attainable. There's some incremental gains that each of you as canola growers can, can capture in growing this crop that'll make us better at it. Already talked about this slide, but sclerotinia, the topic that I'm gonna talk about today, fits really nicely into the integrated pest management, those diseases and insects that tend to rob yields from us. But sclerotinia is a little bit different for a disease in that I think it kind of impacts every part of growing this crop. So everything from harvest management, where you're having difficulty keeping any of those small shriveled kernels that you might get paid for that are suffering from sclerotinia, through to fertility management, how much have you pushed this crop and created a canopy that's conducive for sclerotinia, plant establishment, how thick is that crop, how wide are your rows, and we've got some really good improvements in genetics that might help us manage this disease. I almost always do this in a presentation and I never do it when I have other Canola Council staff in the room because you just saw the 52 disappear. Because you heard me describe my territory and my territory ranges from what I would call Lacombe, deep black soils, to Oyen, where if I talked about 52 bushels on a regular basis, they, again, their eyes would glaze over and they'd laugh at me because 30 is a pretty safe target there if you're not an aggressive grower and if you can't guarantee, if you can't guarantee rain. And I've, I've yet to meet a grower outside of the irrigation zone that can, can guarantee rain. But they've had some good rain across my whole territories and I think all of my growers probably have 50 in mind or higher when they start to grow a crop. But I'd like you to think what that number is on your farm and then apply the two, three, five or eight extra bushels that we might be able to gain over the next 10 or 15 years. Into the topic at hand, sclerotinia is a fungal disease. The reason that it's such a problem is that it's got a really wide host range. So probably more than 400 species. Uh, I'll just stick to the seas. So everything from canola to cleavers to Canada thistle can have sclerotinia. So you think about your crops, sunflowers, peas, soybeans to a lesser extent, dry beans. That might help explain the title of my presentation. 
Sclerotinia, the other white combine, the other name for sclerotinia is white mold. And if you're a bean producer, that's probably how you refer to it. And a good tie-in for this is that sclerotinia might not be as dramatic as hail, but it probably robs as much yield when you look across the prairies, how many fields, how many plants are infected by this disease, and how severe it can get in some regions on any given year. Factors that contribute to sclerotinia stem rot, the amount and availability of moisture, you've heard me say that already, rain drives this disease, a suitable temperature, a conducive microenvironment, essentially we're talking about how much moisture is in your crop canopy, and if you've listened to any sales reps or any person like myself talk about sclerotinia, we always talk about what's your crop canopy like. And last but not least, we need to know that those spores are present that might cause disease, and that's one of the trickiest things to try to predict for this disease. Sclerotinia's life cycle, I took out all the fancy auto ad advance and come, come at you one at a time to talk about this disease, because getting through this material in 45 minutes is going to be a challenge without the fancy PowerPoint tricks. But essentially we start with what I would call the mouse turds, the little black sclerotes that you'll find in your canola sample or you'll find in the middle of a, a sunflower stem. And those are the seed for this disease. If that seed gets the right conditions, it'll germinate, it'll make these golf T-shaped mushrooms. And that's where the spores will come off of when they're ripe. Those spores, when they're released, end up in the air. They need to land on a suitable tissue. Canola petals are perfect, good food source for them. Those petals will land somewhere else on the plant, or perhaps the ascospores will land on the petals when they're somewhere else on the plant. And with some available moisture, they'll penetrate that leaf, move into the stem, and cause the kind of infection that you see those white bleach stems there on the middle. And when you crack those stems open, you've got the seed there ready for next year. So one cycle for this particular disease in every, any given year. Sclerotinia was a real issue in 2016. This is a field from one of the drier areas of my territory, uh, a little east of Four Nation, which typically doesn't spray for sclerotinia. The grower in question here uh, had never sprayed for sclerotinia and had never thought he would need to. Had a lot of rain this year and had 30 to 80% infection, depending on where I stuck my head in his canopy. So nice crop, but not nearly the yield that he would have been expecting. Now, a lot of things will turn canola prematurely ripe or turn it yellow or, or start to, to fade off. I'm not sure if you can see that picture that there's some yellowing plants in the background of a predominantly green field. And it's really important for a grower to understand, is it sclerotinia that's choking this plant, individual plant off? Is it black leg? You can see the cut stem there. No black leg in this particular field. In my area, it could be club root. If you're not pulling canola out and looking at roots, you're probably missing a really important key in your in your scouting decision. But in this case, it's all sclerotinia. I almost never use a disease triangle when I'm talking to growers. It feels like I'm taking you back to school and you're, you're already maybe doing a little too much of that. Uh, so this is the first time I stuck a disease triangle in a presentation. But for sclerotinia, it's a really important thing to understand. We talked about the golf tees, so that's where the spores are gonna come from up at the top, so the pathogen. It doesn't matter what disease we talk about. We talk about the host. Well, my crop alone at 20 million acres in the prairies is more than enough host to keep this disease cycling forever uh, in our part of the world and a conducive environment. The real problem with this disease is, for a, excuse me, from a producer's perspective, the pathogen side of the equation might as well be a black box. You know, you can't see it. You're putting on a preventative fungicide. You don't even know that the disease is, is started in your crop when you are spending the money uh, to manage it. And on top of that, not only is the pathogen a black box, but the environment might as well be a black box from the time that you apply. You can look at the weather forecast, but you can't actually predict how conducive is the weather going to be for sclerotinia development after my fungicide application. So to focus on the pathogen, this is what sclerotinia would look like. All the check marks are these golf tees that I've mentioned. But if you actually get down on your hands and knees and start to look for them, you'll also find a lot of other funny-looking mushrooms and small little growths. The bird nest fungus here at the bottom has a, what looks like a few seeds in it. That's not sclerotinia. There's some rod organisms on the one stem you may or may not be able to see. But once, you get a, once you've been shown this particular mushroom a couple times, you get fairly adept at recognizing it. The problem is, when you talk to a researcher and you say, if I look for these golf tees, 
how many do I need to find or how much risk would there be? And the researcher probably will tell you something like, well, if you get down on your hands and knees in your field or maybe the neighboring cereal field and look, if you search for about 20 minutes and you found them, then they're maybe easy to find. And if you search for 20 or 30 minutes and you don't find them, trust me, they're still there. So finding them is not a measuring stick for managing this disease. It never has been in my 15 or 20 years experience, but there have been years where they're really easy to find, and that would just be what I would consider an added risk. I've stole a couple slides from a researcher in North Dakota, Louis Del Rio. He's uh, uh, really effective at communicating about this disease with growers, and we had him in for a group of people last year. This is a little bit difficult to understand, but every grower asks me, how do I know when these things are around and when they germinate? And if you take a look at this chart, I'm going to say from the left, the first four, the first four or five bars there are referring to a continual state of moisture. So the numbers across the bottom are percent field saturation. So 100% there, with no bar in it, means that none of these things germinated. So until you start to grow rice, that's not a management strategy for sclerotinia. All right, flooding is not an option for us, but they really don't like 100% field capacity. However, we go to 75, 50, 25%, at 25% field capacity, so a reasonable amount of moisture in your, in your crop, has pretty good germination of this disease. The other bars, which I won't go into, are fluctuating uh, moisture conditions. So if you look at the next set, underlined by the line, if you started at 100 and dropped to 75 or dropped to 50 or dropped to 25, that's the kind of germination you would expect. Or moving over if you start, if you start at 75 and drop to 50. Um, regardless, the number of spores that each of these golf tees produce are so large that only a few can provide all the damage or seed for damage that you require. So percentage germination is a measure of risk, but doesn't really reflect exactly how aggressive this disease will be. The other thing is that would tie into this is how long does it take to grow these golf tees or to get them ready to release spores? Um, under the same sort of moisture conditions with Louise, it's ranging from 20 to 60 days, depending on the moisture conditions that he's got there uh, for these golf tees to germinate and emerge. So you need, some, you need some appropriate moisture conditions prior to flower development, very similar to what you've been told in the past, that you're gonna need some, you're gonna see, need some moisture to get the sclerotes germinated and the disease ready uh, to produce spores. I've combined this slide so it may not make as much sense as it could, but essentially if you look at that really ramped up graph, you can see that not much is happening. Even if you're not a person that likes to read graphs, you can see not much is happening with leaf wetness there in the chart. You've got a few hours of leaf wetness, you've got ascospores present, not a lot of germination, not a lot of growth is happening. But at about 60 hours of leaf wetness, suddenly this disease ramps right up. So it's not just a few hours of leaf wetness, it's continual leaf wetness inside your crop canopy. But unless you walk through your crop on a regular basis, you're probably not aware of how wet it can be, even without significant rainfall in the last week or two. This is what these things would look like if you take a really good picture of them, that they're forcibly ejected off the top of these golf tees. Release tends to happen sort of middle of the day. It's a combination of, of relative humidity and some sort of pressure mechanism in, in the spore release, and I'm sure there's maybe even people in the audience that could describe that better than me. But it's, it's something that happens under what I would consider optimal canola growing conditions. So if you're between 4 and 20 degrees Celsius, you've got good relative humidity, these spores release and are ready to start business. If you think about why you have infection, I've got a number of slides here that I've used for a couple years and simply added the year uh, each, each and every time another calendar date rolls around. In my area, and I'm going to use a pointer on this one, I'm not, okay, I'm right south of Red Deer. So my territory is sort of middle, bottom half of Alberta. And in 2012, am I doing something wrong here? In 2012, okay, in 2012 I had pretty good conditions for sclerotinia in my area. 
And if I remember the map right, and I won't bother looking at it, Brandon did as well, although it was a little drier on the east side. Just a small little yellow dot there. So I'm going to talk about red deer for a slide or two. Good conditions for sclerotinia development. Moisture in June, wet crops as we came into flower. Growers sprayed for sclerotinia, uh, many growers sprayed for sclerotinia, and felt they got more than their money's worth out of that particular season's experience. And I said moisture drives sclerotinia. I'll get you to take a look at the map there of Saskatchewan. So we'll, we'll go for the middle ground, mostly because they really like to make good maps in Saskatchewan and they're readily available. The map of Saskatchewan after that year's worth of rainfall looked something like this, and red is bad. Red means more sclerotinia. So it typically, typically follows moisture patterns. If we look to 2013, in my area, you'll notice again there's a lot of green, blues, meaning we're at 85 to 150 percent of our typical rainfall, and we typically have more than enough rainfall to foster sclerotinia anyway. So another, what looks like good sclerotinia year. However, in that year, we got dry conditions right about the time that sclerotinia flowering uh, was started, actually just a little after most of the guys sprayed their sclerotinia fungicide. We didn't have a lot of sclerotinia development. But when I talked to growers over the winter in, in meetings, already at that point as a canola council agronomist, I said things like, if you didn't spray for sclerotinia in 2012, and the coffee shop didn't convince you that it was worthwhile doing in 2013, in 2014, maybe you should consider a sclerotinia tolerant variety. They were relatively new at that point, but I said, if you were in my local area, and we've already got about 50% of the growers spraying for sclerotinia, you probably need to drive that management decision or help that management decision back to the time when you purchase your seed because it's a little difficult, and I understand that, it's a little difficult on July the 1st or July the 7th to pull the trigger on another $30 investment in that crop. 2014, sort of an average year for sclerotinia. Uh, a little hard to, hard to predict, and I would say on a field-by-field -field basis, I still had a lot of growers spraying for sclerotinia, and a number of them happy with the, with the idea, but, but a little bit hit and miss if you got rewarded for spraying and spending that extra, extra input. 2015, completely different story. Uh, now, if you've been watching my story, I've had three years where you may have sprayed sclerotinia to manage the disease, and now I had growers phoning me to tell me, I've sprayed for two or three years, why shouldn't I spray this year? Well, this year represents one of the few years where as, agro as an agronomist, I felt pretty comfortable saying, if your crop is so dry, you're wondering if crop insurance should come right it off, there's no reason to spend more money on this. There's no moisture there. The moisture that is there as due isn't staying long. This is a year that you don't have to spray sclerotinia. And I think I only got called to one field that actually had more than 30% sclerotinia. So I was probably right. But still, on a field-by-field -field basis, some potential to, to guess wrong. 2016 comes along. If you've been watching this graph, you'll notice that I took moisture conditions from May to the third week of July. I thought that was a great time frame to talk about sclerotinia moisture. Um, but when I look at this chart, it didn't really describe what I thought was happening in 2016. So if you take the moisture conditions through to the end of August, because we had a longer flowering period, and the crop flowered for quite some time, and across most of the prairies, we had rain every three to five days, perfect conditions for sclerotinia to establish itself, and not only establish itself, but continue to spread up and down that stem and around the canopy if it happened to lodge or manage to, manage to spread in any way. To drive home that point again, I'll rely on Saskatchewan. Across the bottom, I've circled the years that, all the years that they, uh, generally described as wet. And you'll notice that incidence of sclerotinia or the percentage of plants in the fields that they surveyed went up dramatically. So I think I've already talked to you about the fact that moisture drives sclerotinia. A graph from 2016, I'm sure somebody stole this from someone like Holly uh, for, for a graph. Sclerotinia and blacklegs sort of compete for your most important disease in, in Manitoba, I'm, I'm sure. But this year, the description of sclerotinia was typically somewhere along the lines, whether you were in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, or Alberta, a grower would say something like, this disease is eating my crop, or that my crop is melting under the amount of sclerotinia that's present in the field. So really significant disease pressure, whether it was Manitoba, Saskatchewan, or Alberta, 
and simply tied to the amount of moisture and the consistent moisture that we had available. Why should you care? Well, it's yield impact. At the end of the day, you get paid for the number of bushels that you can get in a, get in a granary and manage to sell. Estimated yield loss annually across the prairies is 5%. If you told me you were going to lose 5% of sclerotinia, I'd say, who cares? You know, at 5% of a 50 bushel crop, it's less than two bushels, two and a half bushels at the most. You're going to pay 20 to $30 to control that disease. The problem is that that's a nice average, 5% across the prairies. There's going to be fields in that average that were 30, 40, 50% or higher. And it's those wreck years that justify trying to control this disease aggressively because we can't predict when it's going to be 20, 30% and really pay to control the disease. A little bit of a, a note there at the bottom to estimate yield loss, and this is just a rule of thumb because it really varies based on when the plant was infected. Infected early, you'll see no yield. Infected really late on a side branch, you'll lose the, the yield from that branch or perhaps half the yield from that branch. But as a general average, we say that for every infected plant, you lose half of the yield on that plant. So a 30% infection in your field should give you about a 15% yield reduction. How can we control sclerotinia tem stem rot? I'm going to talk about four sort of related topics. One, tolerance. I'm going to call it tolerance, not resistance. Cultural or agronomic controls. Things that you would change in your farming practices that might lessen the impact of this disease. Biological options, of which there's a couple. And people working on more all the time. Uh, and a fungicide application is currently our best method for controlling this disease or the most commonly used tool. Sclerotinia tolerant varieties, we've had these on the market for a number of years. I've stolen this from an advertising piece uh, from, from one of the companies that, that sell these. And if you look from your left to your right, you'll see uh, bad sclerotinia at the number one, if you want to call it high incidence of, of disease, to really not impacting the crop at number nine. And a brief discussion if you're, if you're entertaining the idea of using this technology, that a susceptible variety, one that doesn't have any genetic resistance or any change in architecture or structure or crop canopy that would help it prevent sclerotinia um, as the most impacted, with a tolerant variety taking you about halfway across the bar to controlling this disease and spraying your typical variety probably being a little better than that, but better than that yet spraying a resistant variety shown on the chart as, as being even better than that. Um, and, of course, because it's an advertising piece, a little disclaimer along the bottom that says, in years with extreme sclerotinia pressure, you might need to spray twice. So this disclaimer concept comes up a lot when you talk in front of people because we're never 100% right. We give you our best information and we hope that you can gain some value from it. On top of what I would call tolerant material, we probably do have some material in, in the foreseeable future that I would call resistant. So Lona Buckwald out of, uh, out of Ag Canada, Saskatoon, has screened about 400 varieties for sclerotinia resistance. And at the top of this chart, uh, you probably can't see it, she's identified a couple different uh, cultivars or lines that have improved sclerotinia tolerance or resistance. Most of those are from Asian sources, a couple. You can see some ones in Europe. But she's got a number of varieties that showed promise for sclerotinia resistance. And the graph here showing, the green line, showing one of her most promising uh, cultivars that they've, that they've found from, I believe that one's a Korean source, where the line is showing the amount of growth that a lesion on the stem of this variety has. The top line being a susceptible variety that, uh, that we've had in research uh, in the early 90s with no resistance, but the bottom line showing a real improvement in the ability of this, of this cultivar to resist sclerotinia. Much better than, in my opinion, the material the market today. And on top of that, you want me to switch? No issues. Should be good to go. Do I sound just as good? All right. On top of that, um, this material is already in, in uh, an advanced breeding line from Ag Canada that they've made available to, 
to the private breeding institutions where we don't get to hear about some of these developments well in advance. We typically hear about these kind of developments from a, a life science company when they're willing to show their marketing guys. So, so this is probably a little earlier than that uh, in terms of timeline, but it, it is something that I would say is available in the foreseeable future. And when they make improvements upon uh, this material and start to stack some of those resistant mechanisms that they're, they're finding, you'll see even, in, even more resistance to the disease. So a really positive development. Lodging susceptibility, the lamest slide in my presentation. The best thing about lodging uh, resistance or, or lodging issues now is that the varieties we have tend to stand up a lot better than they did 15 or 20 years ago, even when you push them with nitrogen. Because if you have a little bit of sclerotinia in your crop and the crop lays down, then it travels from stem to stem and really makes a mess in your crop. And I'll close with a picture and a slide that shows you what that would look like. The third point was, uh, or the second point was cultural controls. When we talk about disease management, we almost always talk about crop rotation. So I'm going to tell you that crop rotation is one of the best tools you can use to manage disease on your farm. But not for sclerotinia. All right, because those sclerotes are relatively smart, they last a few years in the soil, they're waiting for the appropriate weather conditions. This graph shows you that whether you're doing something that I would take you out back and hurt you for, back-to-back -back canola, or whether it's one in two, or one in three, or one in five, crop rotation, really insignificant impact on the disease management for this disease. Effective rotation, years since previous canola crop versus years since other susceptible crop, really same graph. There's pretty much a flat line, regardless of where you're at for frequency of host crops in your rotation. So crop rotation isn't much of, a, much of an impact. I had two slides on effect of uh, nitrogen fertility. The, the second slide didn't have a source, didn't know where I had it from. Um, but I, I, I gladly gather up slides and presentation material from wherever I can get it. So I chose this one. It tells you the age, 1997. I think the bottom says Robin Morrell. Uh, so it's, it's a dated slide, but shows you as you increase nitrogen fertility, you tend to get more sclerotinia. Makes sense. Bigger, lusher, thicker, healthier crop. A little easier to get that disease progressing in there. I told you I took that slide out, so I guess I better the next time I, uh, I show it. Other cultural control options. Seeding rate can have an impact. If you have a crop that's far too thick with no air movement, sure, it can, it can enhance sclerotinia's ability to spread. Things like row width, that would impact airflow, uh, disease development, row orientation, the direction it's actually going. If you irrigate, not, I'm not in an area where a lot of that happens. Uh, even things like tillage might impact sclerotinia. But the take home message is that if you can figure out a way to manage those factors to reduce sclerotinia, I guarantee that it reduces your canola yield. So if you're aiming to grow a good crop of canola, the practices that grow a good crop of canola tend to tip the balance in favor of a good crop of sclerotinia as well. Biological control, there's two, there's two that would fit into this category. One that is relatively unique for us and one that we might as well consider as a fungicide. Uh, and the first one I'll talk about is Contans. It's been on the market a number of years. I've even sold it once. My bio at the start said that I worked in, uh, in sales for a fertilizer dealer for a few years. I had a carrot grower in my area that had a real issue with what we'd call white mold, sclerotinia, same story, same disease. But when he puts his carrots in storage, and I buy them in February, I can often find, not often, because he's pretty careful, but I can find a fuzzy one in the bag once in a while. And when you talk to him, because I know him quite well, he has tubs of carrots that basically rot, same story, melt, uh, because they've got sclerotinia or white mold infection in storage. So. I sold it once to a carrot guy and he's never bought it again, so I'm not sure what that tells you about the product, but it's one of those products that will take a little bit of a learning curve to use and develop. But if you take a look at these slides, the one on, the, on uh, your right that shows some fungal growth around each of the sclerotes is without the product contans, and the one on your left is with contans, and this is a, another fungus that essentially eats the sclerotes. And best results are likely 
from a relatively high rate, given more than 90 days to work in the soil, preferably incorporated. You can read the product label to get the details. Um, but likely also under really high sclerotinia pressure. So if you're going to use this, use this product, uh, I've heard it speculated that the best results happen when there's a lot of food for contents to work on in the soil, and it can spread and multiply a, a bit uh, to have this, this work to control sclerotinia. Serenade uh, comes in a jug, looks like a fungicide, but isn't. Uh, it's another biological product product that, uh, that has some fungicidal activity and there's a bit of a, a chart there showing that it, that it probably compares to some of the products uh, that are registered fungicides on the market but classifies as a biological. Fungicides are still the most important tool we have to manage this disease. We think we understand them reasonably well. I stuck that 30% of acres are sprayed because uh, the slide that I inherited said 25 to 25 uh, said 10 to 25 percent, so it was a really old slide. Uh, in a lot of areas, I would say there's 80 percent plus of fields sprayed for sclerotinia, so 30 sounded like a good number. In most of these presentations, I have a slide that talks about the number of products available and the group, the fungicide grouping that they're in, and that slide gets outdated about every second year as a new fungicide comes on the market, so I've skipped that, and simply I'm going to say that there's a number of product options in a lot of different groups with a a, a range of use patterns and water volumes that are available on the market. But the difficulty in using a fungicide is trying to decide when you're going to make money spraying it. And sclerotinia, I've already told you, is difficult to predict. So not only are fungicides maybe a little hard to predict for payback, but they're a lot easier to predict in a cereal crop or a disease that you can see, where you can watch the progression from the third leaf down onto the penultimate leaf and you know that you're tracking a disease that could rob some yield from you as it infects leaf tissue. This disease you can't see and you don't know what it's doing when you're deciding to spend the money. So when to spray a fungicide? The story that I've told on sclerotinia fungicides has been the same for 20 years. You spray it 20 to 50 percent bloom, but that's a little harder to figure out uh, than you would think. And it changes quickly. So 20% bloom, you've got approximately 15 flowers open on the main stem. I'm not really sure how someone came up with the idea that this was 20% bloom. All right, because the first time as a summer student that I was told to predict uh, percentage flower, they didn't actually hand me a protocol that would have told me that I was supposed to tell them when half of the plants had one flower. They told me, tell me when 50% of the flowers are out. So I spent the next two weeks when I traveled to my canola plots pulling flowers off and counting flowers and I think the highest number that I pulled off a plant was 200 or so as I was trying to predict when 50% happened. So 20% bloom is simply a number in my mind and it reflects 15 open flowers relatively early in, in the progress and it's often three to five, uh, less than a week after you see that first yellow flower open. Um, on the plant. 30% bloom, just a little more, 18 to 20%. If you're doing one application, speculation is this is the best time to put that single application down. 50% bloom, still before significant petal drop is probably the real significant take home message for this. And we would say that the crop is at its peak yellow. Well, depending on moisture conditions, this crop could stay yellow for another three weeks. So when we talk about coating flower petals with a fungicide application, we're really only coating the petals that are there uh, at time of application. We also need to think about making sure we drive that fungicide application down into the canopy and try to get as good a coating on all the plant material that's there as we can. How do we optimize control? Crop staging, make sure you've, you know what stage your crop is at and you put it on, we think, at the start of flowering because that's our best guess on when we can protect that main stem and the bulk of the yield that will come off of a, a standard or a, a relatively normal stand of canola. Get good coverage, make sure your water volume's up. At least one of the products on the list that I would normally talk about has a 20 gallons per acre recommended water volume rate. And it's really important, the more water you have, the better the coverage you have, the more likely this product is to work for you. Uh, and choose the right product and rate. To be honest, the right product isn't that important to me. If you get the first two right, product choice is far down on my list of things 
my things uh, to choose because your ability to predict how bad sclerotinia is um, is relatively low and your ability to see differences between these products uh, when, when all of them do a pretty good job is, is almost non-existent. If you have a rep come into your field looking at sclerotinia and says something like my product would have done a better job, send them to talk to me because I'm, I'm not aware of too many people that have that kind of uh, skill or confidence in individual products for sclerotinia. Risks of fungicide use, there's two that I'm going to talk about. One, you might be spending money that you don't have to spend. And two, uh, you'll hear us talk about resistance for weeds. Resistance for, scler for fungicides is just as real and in fact has already happened for sclerotinia. Uh, Central Alberta, I'm not sure if it's happened elsewhere, years ago we had resistance to benalate. So the first product on the market that we used in on a, on a fair number of acres uh, and the disease was relatively tolerant to it. So it can happen and it has happened already. Uh, and most of us when we spray for sclerotinia choose a favorite system, choose a favorite product and then use that product all the time for that disease and maybe even in combination with other products on your cereals. How do I know when I should spray? You're gonna, you're gonna not be impressed with my method here. But before I deliver that, you're gonna look for information. So things like your local, your, your local Manitoba Agriculture website, that's my five minute mark, I'm gonna have to speed up a lot. Um, we'll tell you when the crop is wet, when the ground is wet, but the most, the most accurate, um, the most immediate test is when your pants are wet, when you walk through the crop, sometime I would suggest between 10 in the morning and 2 in the afternoon, if your pants are wet, your crop canopy is wet, you've had moisture in June and your crop is starting to flower, then you're going to talk about needing to spray a sclerotinia fungicide. There's things like the checklist on our website. It talks about the history in your field. How many years since canola? Did you have sclerotinia the last time? What kind of moisture conditions have you got? If you get up to 40 points on this checklist, there's a disclaimer somewhere at the bottom of it too, but the suggestion is that you're at risk and you should be considering spraying. Saskatchewan's changed it a bit. We're testing or they're testing uh, through Canada a sclerotinia depot system, so a little bag where we seed sclerotinia and see if it emerges. Uh, it struggled a little bit, but instead of the regional portion that's at the bottom of our checklist, how are you hearing about sclerotinia golf tees in neighboring fields or in your area? They're asking on this particular checklist, what percentage of the seeds in this sclerotinia depot have germinated? And it could be a useful tool, but it's not working quite right yet. This is what it would look like, a little bag that we plant in the ground. There's been a lot of different canola petal test kits, because I told you the flower was sort of the, the energy bar or the seed stock or the starter for this disease. There's been a lot of tests developed that will test for spore presence on those flower petals as far back as 91 to 95, where growers could plate them out themselves and watch for the, the fungus to, to develop. There's been a number of PCR or qPCR uh, tests where you actually test for the DNA on those petals uh, and they're, they're pretty accurate but we're not quite sure how uh, comparable they are to field results. What level do you need to show uh, when you should spray, when you shouldn't spray. And it's even available commercially from a company called Quantum Genetics out of Saskatoon where they send you a kit, you pull the petals, you send it back to them. Um, under optimal conditions they get you feedback in less than a day uh, after they receive the kit. So there are some tools that will start to make that black box of the spores uh, improve a bit. In development, this one's really cool, I haven't touched one or handled it myself, is a spore sensor that I'll call them Alberta Innovates, they've got Innotech is their new name, but it's a spore that, it's a spore counter that's, uh, if you want to call it, it looks like a cell phone sitting out in your field. And through some technology that I'm not qualified to, uh, to describe, but some immunoanalysis technology, they can actually count individual spores with this sensor and have, your, have the spore sensor through a cell phone text you when it hits a certain number. Now we don't know what that number is yet, but it can text you and tell you that the spores are present. So at least it could give you a yes or no. All right, I have moisture. I've had moisture in the past. The weather forecast looks bad, but I actually have a new tool that says I don't have spores in my field yet. Well, all that means to me is you should listen to the, check your cell phone again the next day and the day after that because if every other condition on this checklist matches, you are going to spray once spores are present. 
North Dakota has some interesting things where they've continued to make a map for sclerotinia risk. So they'll generate maps like this, and it's based on soil moisture conditions, weather data. You can even, uh, they've modified the checklist that keep coming back to this concept that there's a list of factors that drive this disease, where you pick your closest weather station and you give it a, the, the same type of information. They've in, even included things like row width and tillage, but I'm going to tell you that those are really insignificant factors in the disease, but, but they can tweak the model to make it a little more accurate. Uh, to help growers make that decision. And they say that they're about 75% right uh, with this particular tool. So in summary, sclerotinia is variable. If you read my little, my little bio uh, in the book, it says the most, uh, how did I word that? The most unpredictably consistent yield robber that we have in canola. And I think that's a pretty fair description. If you've got the potential for a good crop and the moisture to get it there, chances are sclerotinia is a disease that you're going to need to manage. And after a couple years of consistent moisture, where the sclero sclerotes drop to the ground and the, the pressure or the, the seed stock to drive this disease has increased, I think that disease gets more difficult to manage. So I would suggest that if 2016 was a particularly terrible year for sclerotinia in your fields, you should really be watching 2018 if you're a one in two canola grower because those fields will be at really high risk compared to what we're used to in the past. Thanks for listening. We'll see you at Manitoba Ag Days 2018 from January 16th to 18th.